Hey gang, this is me, Mr. Motivator. Now, you have a choice in life, but there's only one thing worth listening to, and that is write up my podcast. These guys are so cool, and with me on there, they're even better. Say yeah. It's right up my street, my boulevard. It's right up my straza. Oh my God, it's garden right up there. Oh, it's right up my podcast. Welcome to Write Up My Podcast. My name's Gwen Watson. And my name's Kate White. And this is the podcast in which we talk to fascinating people about the fascinating ways that they have to make you feel good. And this episode, we are speaking to Anne Therese, the climate optimist, who is a speaker, an educator and an environmental activist. Well, it started off as we wanted to research the relationship between activism and happiness Mm. didn't we yeah and then it took us down this rabbit hole until we arrived at Anne who really specializes in climate optimism but we'll tell you more about what that actually means and what that actually is later on and I think this one might be this one might be one that's not an instant fix. It might be one that we have to work on. That's what, what that's my feeling from the try oh, out yeah. section. This is going to be oh, a 100%. slow burn. Yeah, this is a big kind of over the course of your life change to make as opposed to give it four days and you'll have sorted it all out. (laughs) Go for a walk, hug a tree tonight, you're feeling marvellous. Much as I love a quick fix, I'm all about a life hack. I'll do anything to cut corners and get there faster. Yeah, but it's all going to hopefully make us feel good. Um, Hey, Kate, speaking of, what have you been doing to make yourself feel good, my love? Oh, man, I've been uh, camping, been to Madrid, been out and about. It's been great. Good Lord. I've been not been watching that much telly. I know we often talk about what we've been watching, but it's just been too gorgeous. Yeah. But I have been reading a book which is slightly different to the sort of books I normally read. So we'll have already spoken about this. So our Patreon followers will have already have heard a little bit about us. <laughs> our Patreon about followers this. are like, yawn, yawn, yawn. Why do we have yeah. to hear about this again? Maybe I'll put a different spin on it this time. <laughs> So I went to the Bristol Comedy Gardens a couple of weeks ago, which is this outdoor comedy festival. They have a whole series of comedians every night, different comedians. I love that. Summer has arrived when you're at an outdoor comedy festival. That's bloody brilliant. And it really felt like that. It really felt like one of those dreamy summer evenings, you know, when you've got a PIMS in hand, because that's what us Brits do when the sun's shining. (laughs) And who did I see on that night? I saw Phil Wang, who was incredible. I don't know if you've heard Phil Wang. I don't think I've heard of Phil Wang. So he's half Malaysian, half English, and I only quote that because that's quite central to his act. Oh, I absolutely know him. I've just Googled him. He was on Taskmaster for those Taskmaster fans out there. Yes. There was also, I was about to say Mike Wazowski, but I'm pretty sure that's a character from Monsters, Inc. movie. Um, (laughs) So I I think he's actually called Mike Wozniak. The guy also from Taskmaster with the moustache. Also from Taskmaster. Love is also him. in Man Down, which is Greg Davis' um, uh, oh. uh, like sitcom show yes. that he does. Oh, he's hilarious. We have? An incredible female comedian who I can't remember her Kate, name. Kate, don't She's... let the ladies down. Come on. What's wrong with me? <laughs> I don't remember her name because she wasn't on the lineup, so I wasn't expecting her. But then she rocked up and blew our minds with her incredible humour. <laughs> they, d- they didn't which... expect her to be funny. They didn't even put her on the lineup. <laughs> They're like, let's throw in a woman, see how she does. <laughs> and she blew the roof off the house. <laughs> I mean, it was an outside joke, but we won't get too technical. (laughs) But anyway, the person I want to speak about is Tim Key. So uh, Tim Key is an actor, a poet, a comedian, but I'd only ever seen him in his acting guise before and I wasn't a fan at all. But Mm. then seeing him do his stand-up was hilarious. Maybe it's because I had low expectations that he blew blew me away, but he was so funny. He was so unhinged. He was just so derailed. (laughs) And I just found him properly hilarious but anyway off the back of it um a friend of mine lent me his book and it's called tim key using words as my wife (laughs) and it's basically a book that he penned during (laughs) lockdown Mm. which i think we're all kind of my i sort of find myself rolling my eyes when people talk about oh it's all about someone's lockdown experience because that just feels (laughs) you're like too cliche don't make me go back there (laughs) yeah i'm over it i'm running away towards 2023 trying to put it further behind me 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's basically conversations he had with people during this time, plus his poetry, and it's just surreal and bizarre. And it's oh. really the the book is really beautifully graphically laid out. It's in in a really sort of I don't know. So it's it's yeah, I'm really enjoying it. Oh, good, good. So you'd yeah. recommend Tim Key's book? I would. I would. His poems are brilliant. Follow him on an Instagram because he does some brilliant poems all about what's going on in politics right now. Ooh. And they're really sort of surreal and scathing and clever. If, yeah. if we can have a laugh about what's going on in politics right now, that is all the better, frankly. Well, this can, is it. Got to see the funny yeah. in the shit show can that is our government pos- collapsing around exactly. us. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, what about you? Oh, the only other thing I want to say is I'm very excited about seeing going to see Where the Crawdads Sing. <gasps> oh, It's coming out in the cinemas next week. I'm nervous. I know. I'm cu- I've got my arms crossed and I'm clenching my buttocks as I'm speaking. I get it. I can so- almost feel your buttocks <laughs> clenching through the Zoom. <laughs> now, <laughs> Where the Crawdads Sing. Now, this was a book by... Where the Crawdads Sing is a 2022 <laughs> film directed by Olivia Newman, starring Daisy Edgar-Jones, <laughs> Taylor John Smith and Harris Dickinson. <laughs> Oh, right. Is that your right, Siri? Google. All right, Google. <laughs> um, Back I off, just... Google. You're not invited. <laughs> I just wanted to really subtly get the get the author's name. <laughs> there was nothing subtle about Busted. that. Dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, Delia Owens was the American author that wrote it. It was a 2018 novel. If you've not read it, oh my goodness, it's such a great book. It's so beautiful. And the descriptions. I think we've spoken about it on this podcast. Yes, before, we actually. have. The descriptions of where she lives. Um, are so evocative you just it just takes you there and it's such a landscape that's so different and alien from anywhere that really we've got in the UK anywhere I'd been you know the sort of swamp lands and marshes it's yes amazing. it's the um it's the marshlands of North Carolina and she's basically she's to all intents and purposes orphaned as a child and is, yeah. brings herself up and Pretty um much. And it, it's it's that life. But anyway, it's such a beautiful, beautiful book, it and it's now being adapted to a film. So I it's know. like, oh, please don't fuck it up. But it has so been taken on by. It's being produced by Reese Witherspoon. So you've kind of it's in safe hands. Yeah, it's in safe hands. So I mean, I've read some. Can I say mixed reviews? I don't want to, I'm not going to yeah. go, yeah. So, but anyway, I think if you, maybe if you love the book and we love Reese Witherspoon and we love who's playing the lead, um, Daisy Edgar Jones, who is absolutely, she's an absolutely brilliant actress, isn't she? What have we yeah. seen her in? Normal um, People. Oh, that's her from Normal People. Yeah, I think so, anyway. Yes, it is. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. So I think if we go in, we've already got a lot of love for it, then surely yeah. we're going to enjoy the film. <laughs> exactly. And I plan on going to see it in a cinema where there's comfy seats in a bar. So the worst thing that will happen is I get to enjoy <laughs> a nice drink while watching a mediocre film. So it's a win-win. win-win. Is there a panic button where you can order more drinks <laughs> midway yeah, through? Shit! The film's unravelling. Bring me an old-fashioned stat. Gin! <laughs> Bring me gin to my seat. And a blanket, even though it's 40 degrees outside. <laughs> yeah. what, what about you anyway, Gwen? Come on, tell me. What have you been up to? Oh, God. I mean... I'm trying hard to put a big old smile on my face here and think of some positives because, as our Patreons will know, I went to Greece. It was wonderful for two and a half days, but I did a boo-boo. I did a boo-boo, didn't I? I fucked up my own holiday. And this is the reason why this episode is a week late. Uh, Sorry, by the way. Um, anyway, I'm tr- I want to I want to dress this story up like I was attacked by a shark. I'm still working on what the story is going to be, but meanwhile, the truth is, I cut myself shaving. Oh, no. <laughs> like in the most dramatic. You know when you cut yourself, when you cut yourself, and you just know, don't you? When you've taken out a yeah. real long slice, oh, Golden <sighs> Bennett. And then I went swimming in the sea for two days because I was brought up thinking, thinking that seawater would do it good. And me too. Yeah, surely. But um, anyway, let me just let me just um, uh, dispel that myth for you that seawater, especially oh. in the Med, where it's warm, um, and the water was just like, like walking into a bath. Gosh, I enjoyed oh. it for those two and a half days. Um, anyway, due to whatever. Uh, 
absolutely hideous bacteria was in there. I was infected through the open wound in my leg right up to my armpit. Like, oh. it's on my ankle, like in my groin, my armpit, like my <gasps> arm was... All your lymph nodes swollen oh, up, obviously yeah, fighting off everything. the infection. Yeah, oh my God, so much pain. My foot swelled up so much they thought I had thrombosis, so I had to go to oh. hospital for scans. God. I'm laughing now. This is what I do in therapy. I laugh when I'm talking about things that have really upset me. She's like, Gwen, you're telling me this with a big smile on your face. I'm like, that's how I cope. Um, anyway, I had three days of going to different medical experts. What a waste of resources for them all. But anyway, um, antibiotic cream was replaced with antibiotics, which then when I got home was replaced by more antibiotics. Anyway, so I'm still healing. I'm still trying to work out. <laughs> I'm still trying to work out what are the lessons in this can't just yes. be to wax instead of shave, surely. Um, but what it did make me think of, a friend a friend pointed out, there was a survey. Actually, I'm going to read this. Um, <laughs> there was a survey that says that anticipation is such a strong feeling that people are often happier in the anticipation of a holiday than in remembering the actual experience. Mm. It is the anticipation that is generating this happiness. This um, and it generates an improved feeling of well-being, often more so than the actual event itself. And this is one of those case in point. <laughs> That's say. so yeah. interesting. Yes. And actually, that makes a lot of sense. Mm. I mean, Christmas is a great example of that. All the excitement, the build up, you know, when you're a yeah. kid, you're so excited. And then Christmas Day itself can sometimes be a bit of a uh, sort of non-event, really. You know, everyone yeah. sort of eats too much and falls yeah. asleep and but it's the lead up to it that's fun well yes well certainly for this holiday i was so excited in advance it, oh, i was going on right. holiday with friends i've never been on holiday well most of them have never been on holiday with a whole bunch of us we had two houses on a little island in greece little little really hard to reach no local hospitals island in greece oh, it's the dream it's the dream <laughs> <laughs> and and it was and we were heading into uncharacteristically warm weather it was going to be wonderful and I, I definitely had the thought of oh god I'm looking forward to this so much like what's right. going to go wrong I, oh, it cannot so you... pos I was uh, is it my fault did I antis did I make this happen I was like this Were can't too possibly yeah. I was like this can't possibly live up to how excited I am about it the anticipation and I think well uh, mine was a bit of a dramatic fall down but um but I do think that that does apply to lots of different things. My birthday yeah. party last year, I was really yeah. excited about it. But on the night, wanted everybody to leave by 10pm so I could lie on the sofa and watch telly. <laughs> but instead, they're all having a techno party in my kitchen. God Ooh. damn those party goers <laughs> having a good time. But do you, get, do you get that as well with like when you're having a birthday or a party or something? Do you find so, that it doesn't so live it I've... up or flip that whole theory 180 because I will be racked with anxiety in the lead up to right. throwing a party. I love going to someone else's party. I love it so much. But throwing my own one, the lead up to it, I'll be racked with anxiety. Just about will anyone turn up? Will they have a good time? Will it be a success? Yes. And then when it happens, I'm like, oh, well, this is actually really fun. Oh, OK. Oh, I am quite enjoying myself. OK. So, so you've got so the opposite. opposite. You dread yeah. it and then it's better yeah. than you think. Absolutely. Yeah. We've got a housewarming party tomorrow, tomorrow <gasps> afternoon. Oh, my God. And I find myself lying in bed at wake going, oh, God, have I invited enough people? Have um, I, you didn't you know, invite me, come? by the way. She didn't invite me. Well, I did wonder about whether I... Well, obviously, it goes without saying, I would love you to be there. I did wonder about whether to invite you, but um, I've got people staying in the spare bedroom. Really doesn't go without saying, Kate. Uh, oh, Gwen, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Do you no, want to come, darling? No, I really don't want to come. I can't. I can't go anywhere. I'm not going anywhere for another two months. I'm just lying on my bed. I'm not going anywhere. It's not safe. But anyway, carry Rubbing on. wheat germ into your skull. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just watching Mamma Mia on, on repeat and um, not... Yeah. I think that's the safest way to enjoy Greece. Uh, but anyway, yes, yeah, so how are you feeling about your party? Are you looking forward to it or dreading it? Now I'm looking forward to it. I mean, we know it's going to be nice weather, so we don't have that whole, oh, what if it rains and everyone has to be in the house? Oh, oh yes, shit. of course. You're you're throwing an outdoor party during a heat wave. Bravo, Kate, bravo. But now it's the flip side. I'm like, oh, my God, everyone's going to be so hot Oof. and wilting in the garden. Have you got a hose pipe and a bucket? 
That's what we used yeah. to have as kids. Got a sprinkler. Put the sprinkler yeah. oh, on. Put the sprinkler on. It'll be fine. It's going to be great. It's going to be fun. But if it was happening in someone else's garden, I'd be a little bit happier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's right up my podcast. Just a reminder about our Patreon page. This is where we put our extras from our episodes and where we put all our jingles and also where Kate and I do a little bit of extra wiffle waffle just for your delectation. Now, we don't rely on advertising in order to fund the production of Write Up My Podcast, but we do have a Patreon page where we would love it if you could go over and if you can donate the cost of a cup of coffee once a month, that would just help to cover the time and the costs that Gwen and I spend in putting these episodes together, cover the time of our talented team who help us out and help us keep producing episodes of Write Up My Podcast with fabulous guests that we know you'd love to listen to. If you'd like to become one of our supporters, head on over to Patreon dot com forward slash write up my podcast so this is episode 29 activism and optimism this episode we talked to swedish born Anne therese who is the founder of the climate optimist she's a speaker educator and long-term environmental activist and i first came across her in an article that she wrote about the relationship between activism and happiness which was actually what started us researching this episode. So we started our conversation with Anne by asking her, how does activism make you feel good? It's interesting because I didn't realize this until I started to dive into the activism myself. But what I recognized is that actually your body will start to reward you for doing the work. And it already does in other ways, but there's so much tied into activism that goes right back to benefiting you as a person and your mental health, your health, uh, your physical health, um, but also it's your spiritual health. And um, it is that it starts fueling what we have, which is the four happiness hormones. Um, mm, and the, the four happiness hormones. Yes. So yes. for those who don't know about them, they are dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphins. And they serve different purposes in our lives. So for example, dopamine is like a productivity hormone, also, also like a feel-good hormone. So that feeling you get when you finally cleaned the kitchen or you finally made that call or whatever it is, you're like, I feel so finally good Finally unloaded the dishwasher. <laughs> yes. All right. That is actually dopamine because it rewards you from getting things done. Um, when we procrastinate, the opposite happens. So every time you procrastinate, you actually lower your de- levels of dopamine. And so it kind of starts to like spin itself because the lower levels you have, it's harder to find the motivation to actually do it because dopamine fuels productivity, creativity, motivation. Um, so once you start to get in the flow of like, I'm a doer, I'm going to get these things done, it's easier to keep on that stride. And what mm. I learned with activism is that it's a lot of that involved. You know, you learn something new and you say to yourself, I don't agree with this. I'm going to see what I can do to make a difference. So you start to act on these things that you learn. You become the change you want to see. And that actually starts to fuel dopamine. So you're like, I feel really good about this. Um, so that's one thing. The second one is serotonin, which is like kind of the opposite to dopamine, which is more like the mindfulness slow hormone. So okay. if you do yoga or you meditate or you like to go for silent walks in nature or just like, you know, do those like really nice slowing down activities, that's how you fuel serotonin. And we actually need the two very like work, well working in a pair because um, mm. first of all, if you have dopamine, you sleep better at night <laughs> um, yeah. and likewise with oh. serotonin. And so you wake up with more serotonin and more dopamine. And if you have a lot of serotonin in your body, you feel grounded, you feel more optimistic, you feel more at ease with things. And it's a very needed feeling to have in any sort of climate work or any sort of activism for that matter, because, you know, if we're always kind of like revved up and anxious and, you know, feel like it's so much urgency involved, it's kind of hard to stay focused and stay motivated. Mm, So to find ways to slow down, to be in nature, to, you know, tend to our mental health, whatever that looks like, actually is really important. And by doing the work, because a lot of activism is actually about slowing down. We usually don't associate that with activism because it's like, how can I create a sign and take to the streets and march or how can I, you know, it's just do, do, do. And especially with climate change, it's like, we need action now. And that's the only thing yeah. we keep hearing. But a lot of that action in itself is actually about just coming down and just being more in the moment, like listening to ourselves, tuning in, you know, finding ways to act from intention and love. Because when we do that, we're not going to go and just impulse by something because we're stressed. We're not going to just like act on the best whatever option because we actually take a moment to come back to ourselves and say, maybe I have enough. Maybe this is perfect. You know, and like when you start to like okay. really tune into those small moments, you realize that we have the answers many times that we are looking for. So yes, that was kind I of for me, that. I'm a do person. Like, it's like, how can I get more things done? So learning this was a yeah. big aha moment for me. 
Um, but okay. those are the two first ones. This, the third one is oxytocin, which is a bonding hormone. And, um, when and what mother, did you say? A bonding hormone? Bonding hormone, hormone yes. Right. So mm -hmm. let's say a mother gives birth to a baby. She releases mm. a lot of oxytocin because she needs to bond with her baby. Um, but we do this too in with other people. Like we are very social creatures. So we live in community with each other. So everything from like cooking with friends to having a phone call or whatever. And like afterwards you feel like, yeah. oh, I'm not alone in the world. Like have you know, this warm feeling, right? Is this what people call the love hormone? Yes, it's also the love hormone. Yeah. So, so you can actually fuel this by yourself, which is pretty incredible. You know, just by you know taking a hot shower, eating a piece of good chocolate, like taking care of yourself, you actually also <laughs> fuel oxytocin. So you don't That's necessarily need other people. All the chocolate. <laughs> yes, self love. <laughs> self love is important, but also connecting with others obviously is very important, um, yeah. which I think we saw during COVID how hard that was for people. Um, I was going to say that one's going to have been sorely depleted for a lot of people over the last yeah. couple of years, isn't it? And you don't really realize how much you need it until it's gone. Um, but mm. what, when it comes to climate work, especially, I think for me, for myself, who's been in this work for so long, you get to a place where you feel so lonely and you only want to care and you start mm -hmm. to lose hope because you're like, no one else cares about this. But the reality is there's so many people out there fighting the good fight. And so when you start to connect with them and join maybe a local grassroots movement or an online sort of community or just like participate in something's already happening, you get mm -hmm. that feel of like, we're in this together. I'm not alone, okay. um, which is also really important. And lastly, I like to just throw in endorphins too, because I think many people know about it. It's like the run is high that we get when we work out, you know, like we feel good about that. Um, it actually makes our sex drive better. <laughs> we have better sex. It also, it's produced when we have sex. So it's like a good hormone for that reason. Um, and for me, when it comes to activism, it's like, well, think about what a lot of activism is. It's like, you know, walking or biking or taking the car. It's turning up for a beach cleanup or going out in nature. So a lot of physical activity involved, which again is going to continue to fuel endor endorphins. So I just used to like, I like to use these four happiness hormones, like just concrete proof that when you show up for the work and you start becoming the change you wish to see, you move away from anxiety and this place of loneliness to into like, actually, I can do a lot of things and I'm going to feel really good about doing it. And I'm doing this together with other people. And that is why I think when you choose that lifestyle, it's going to be really hard to step out. I love this. I love this. So we've been talking a lot about how activism makes you feel good. Let's be specific here. What do you mean when you're talking about activism? What is activism? Great question. Um, again, it's not just about marching the streets. It can take any form. It depends on who you are. Um, everyone's different and we need everyone in this fight or this journey, as I like to refer to it, because it's not really a fight. It's more like a journey. But, you know, some people are more um, inwards and they like to reflect and, and start like having those conversations at home. Some people are engineers and like to come up with new solutions. Other people are, you know, writers, like to write about this in media. So like whatever, you know, sparks you and the, the qualities that you have, that's how you can make the biggest impact. But activism can be as small as just having conversations at home and with your friends, starting to spread awareness, um, telling people that it's okay to be worried about climate change, saying that it's okay we don't have all the solutions and we still have to act, you know? Like I think bringing it back to ground zero to say, we don't know the perfect answer in this, but the truth is we have to change. So let's get excited and do that. Catherine Hayhoe, which is a brilliant climate scientist, she keeps saying the best action you can do is talk about it. Um, but secondly, mm -hmm. like what are small things you can do at home? You can start composting. You can be more aware of how much clothing you buy. Like those small things actually do add up. And I think when we start to shift away from becoming an activist to just being like, I'm a participant on this journey and what can I do to make it better? What can I, like, how can I show up um, and to say to ourselves, may not be my responsibility to fix this because that's a huge responsibility to take on, but I do have the opportunity to partake. And what does that look like mm. for me today? Yeah, great. Because sometimes it feels like there's no middle ground between kind of signing online petitions, which feels like we're doing something that also feels utterly useless. Um, <laughs> And tying ourselves to, I don't know, a jumbo jet as part of XR. It's like, <laughs> is there a middle ground where maybe we don't have to go and risk being arrested? Yes. Uh, um, a friend of mine who actually recommended us that we do this topic, she's just started like writing to her local MP. And she felt, and like you were describing, she feels just so elated and so positive that she's, that she's doing stuff. Yeah, and there is so much middle ground. I feel like our entire lives suddenly becomes this opportunity to, to make a difference, right? Because you can write to your local electives and say, this is what I believe in. There are so many bills circulating that you can just, you can make a call and say, I'm in support of this bill. Let's make it pass. 
um, the more they hear from the citizens, that actually has a huge impact. Signing petitions too is important because they use that number. You know, actually I've heard from people at Sierra Club and other organizations that say, please sign the petitions because we need that. So don't ever feel like okay, you're not right. making a difference. Um, but I understand too that like, it's not you participating. It's like, I'm helping someone else but it doesn't spark those happiness hormones in the same way. It can feel quite passive. Exactly. It? It is, and same action. thing with like just sharing an Instagram post. It's like, well, okay, I'm spreading awareness, but how much does it actually do, right? So um, mm. I think we do need to step into that middle ground and like, what does that look like? And the exciting part is that when it comes to climate change, anything is an opportunity because everything has to change in, in, you know, in one way mm. or another. Um, so mm. I think finding the middle ground where you live, do you live in a house? Do you have an apartment? Um, can you switch to to renewable energy? Can you start to compost if you're not already composting, which is my fa- favorite climate action because you actually like insert yourself back into the cycle of life. You help the whole mm. life cycle become one again. Um, again, shopping, like how much do we buy just on impulse? Becoming more aware of like where your clothes are made and how they're made. Um, can you go thrift shopping instead? And when, as soon as you start looking at your life from the lens of where's my opportunity to make a difference, everything becomes an opportunity. And I think that's when it starts to get really exciting because you realize not only are there solutions, but people are out there working for these solutions. They just, they just need my support. I can support by buying their products. I can support by voting in their bill, whatever it is, um, and just continue to fuel that shift um, into a better world. Because it can be quite scary because we're talking specifically about climate change here, aren't we? And obviously activism can be focused on lots of different areas that need change. But in today, we're going to talk specifically about climate change because that's where you really focus a lot of your energy and power. Um, But it can be quite scary thinking about climate change and reading about what's happening and what could be happening in the future. And I was really interested to read through your website earlier and you had something, you said something that leapt out at me that fear and shame have never sparked change. So how do we, um, with that, with reading all of the information that's out there, how do we change the way we're thinking and talking about climate change? Yeah, how do we change from fear to optimism? Because <laughs> yes. it's terrifying. It's, it, it, you know, it's the sort of thing that makes us wake up in the middle of the night in a panic. Yeah. And just to give you some background, before I began my journey to becoming a climate optimist, and now I'm teaching this, these things, I was an angry activist. I was constantly worried. I would have, I would cry in the shower. Or I would have tantrums in the car. I was completely losing myself all the time. So I understand that. I've dealt with climate anxiety for 15 years. So I know exactly what that's like. And what I recognize is that although with good intentions, we're trying to spread more awareness, to get people more aware, to get people more afraid of the matter, it actually mm. doesn't spark that kind of change that we're looking for because on a sim- simple psychological level, it doesn't trigger action. You know, our brains are actually wired to respond to negative, fearful information with a no-go response because we try to avoid things that we don't want. And then mm. on the other side, when there's something that we do want, we go for it. So if you think about any marketing, for example, I come from advertising, um, any advertisement, has it, it doesn't tell you like, if you don't buy this deodorant, you're going to smell awful. It says, buy this product and you're going to smell amazing. You know, like it's mm. always pulling with that positive because that's, they know that that's how people act. And so why are we not doing that for climate change? And I think where we're at right now is like, yes, we have this incredibly anxiety driven future that we're headed towards. Like, I don't even want to think about what it's going to look like 20 years from now, 10 years from now, if we don't act. And that's really paralyzing in a way because you're like i don't even know if i can take that in Um, but at Mm. the same time we have to think about what if we do act maybe the world of tomorrow is going to be better than we know today you know like there's actually an opportunity for creating something even better and what if instead of like always focusing on like what do we what do we don't want how do we start to like turn our focus towards what do we do want and what if we find the curiosity and the courage and the excitement to work towards a better future not just trying to avoid a disastrous future and i think that is how you start to like balance between becoming aware of the problem, but then at the same time getting excited about the solutions. And I think that middle ground is what's so important because we have to obviously be aware of what we're trying to avoid. But at some point, we have to also shift gear to say, let's focus for this instead. Let's go for that world because that's what we want. Oh, my goodness, is the hat the time we've just kept on talking? It must be the wine. 
And though we do what I don't mind when I'm with you, I could keep going for quite some time more, cause it's never so clear that I totally see. And however I grasp it, it always eludes me in the times that I try to see just one thing true. Well, it doesn't come easy, whatever I do. So keep on with the blarney and the belly fool. All your whiffles and waffles, your nettering too. It fills up the gaps with my My mind open wide, and also it makes me feel happy inside. Cause it's never so clear that I don't always hear, and however I grasp it, it always eludes me. And the times that I try to see one thing true, well, it doesn't come easy, whatever I do. I really love that you are called a climate optimist because I am such a climate pessimist and I am (laughs) one of those people that when people in conversation say to me, oh, well, the earth is going to be fine, you know, the earth will right itself and I'm the one always go, we fucked it, it's too late, there's no way, the earth cannot right itself, all the animals, all the life on this earth is going to go, it's never going to be the same as it (laughs) is at the moment, we have had a miracle and we fucked it. And... um. And I did actually think to myself the other day, I've really got to stop this narrative. This isn't helping me. It's not helping my nerves. It's not helping the people I'm talking to. And like you said, um, yeah, by instilling more fear in people, it's not going to get them into action, is it? So do you think then that the government and the media need to change the way they're talking about climate change in order to galvanise more action? I I do. I really do. Um... I will just also quickly comment on what was just said about, I I also don't think, I mean, it's the reality is we're losing species. The world is changing and it's going to change. Unfortunately, even if we were to stop all fossil fuels production tomorrow, there's already enough carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to continue to warm the planet for a few decades. So like, I think understanding that things will continue to get worse, even if we are headed in the right direction, at first it's going to seem like we're not. And so we're like keeping that in mind because we're in for such a challenge here. Not only do we have to continue to stay focused on the positive and like continue to fuel that optimism in a way, we have to also recognize that we're not going to see the results right away. So that's yeah. the challenge here. And I think when it comes to governments and media, I think governments, please act. Like <laughs> you don't have a choice. You need to really step up and do the right thing. But they also can be fueled by the motivation of better because solar or wind and, and green hydrogen, like this actually provides a healthier cheaper solution to energy for one um and there is so many ways to work with like restoring soil and restoring the oceans that actually give back more than you know what we can even imagine so i think it's like when you start to look at the solution it's you you realize that not only is it possible but there's so many wins and i think we reached a point where like we have nothing to lose and everything to win and when you realize that it's like what like why wouldn't we act right and and I think the balance goes between, because when I first became a climate optimist, I thought that the best way to stay one was to just ignore all the negative and just focus on the positive and like that was my line. But then I realized that my body still knew what was going on. And if you don't pay attention to the anxiety, the fear, the worries, it actually starts to consume you from within. And so I think it's very important to be aware and to tend to that mental piece of like, okay, I have a lot of climate anxiety right now. How can I, you know, help mend that? Um, a huge part of that is the act, action itself and become like staying part of the solution. Um, but I think also like give yourself days when you're not, you know, you're not optimistic about the future when you're like, this is we're we're fucked, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think when it comes to media, I do think that we are at the point right now where like, I'm glad there's so much awareness because the, we didn't used to have so much climate awareness in the media. Now there is, but I think also we need to start, you know, sharing those pieces of, solutions and optimism to to tell people, okay, we're in like a very significant time right now. It's actually an incredibly exciting time to be alive because all of us get to participate in this, in this shift. And so here's what we can do. Uh, and as I think as we start to share more of those stories and actually give people things to act on to say, here's how you can be part of this, you know, let's do this. And I think that is what we're missing right now, which is why people, you know, dig themselves deeper into denial and just kind of not want to know what's going on. And it's not what we need, quite frankly. You've talked about the science of optimism. Tell us a bit about that. (laughs) It's interesting. So, yeah, I mean, I get a lot of pushback for optimism because people are like, it's just such a wishful thinking. And and I did some study into this because I'm like, it can't just be wishful thinking. And so there's actually a lot behind 
the science of optimism and the reason why we have optimism in our lives to begin with. And you might be surprised, but 84% of us are actually optimistically biased. It means that mm. we tend to think that the future is going to be better than it turns out to be. <laughs> if that's your dinner party or your vacation or whatever, you have this amazing view of it. And at first you that's might be so like, true. that happens so often. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. But then you're like, that's dumb. Like, why would I think that things are going to be better than I just get disappointed? But it turns out that we actually need optimism to do things. And um, the reason we can even, th so our most recently developed part of our brain is the frontal cortex. And that is why we can, first of all, think of something that hasn't happened yet. We can think about the future, which most other animals and species can't do. So we can think about the future, which already is like cool. But not only that, but we can actually, you know, anticipate what that future is going to be like. We can be optimistic about it. And when you think about it, if we weren't, you know, if we didn't think that things could be better and like we could actually get, get somewhere better by taking action, how would we ever find the motivation or the courage to, to do these scary things? So we actually mm -hmm. owe it to optimism through all the time for the society that we live in, for like all these crazy inventions that people have been coming up with because people somehow felt like or thought that this is possible. Um, so I think we have to come back to just realizing like there's a lot of science behind here. Like the neuroscience says that we have this incredible part of our brain for a reason because we need optimism to act. And it says too that, you know, when we are angry or afraid, we kind of create a tunnel vision where we can only see the thing we are worried about or the thing we're angry at. If you've ever been really angry, you might be like, I totally know what you're saying because I couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> and, and it's good because if you're in a survival mode, it's like, I'm so afraid of this tiger, I need to escape. Like you can only think of that. But when it comes to the bigger problems, we have to be creative. We have to have open minds. We have to like vision, you know, vision something better. And, and that's when we need optimism because optimism allows us to expand our minds. And so instead of being narrow-minded to be like, oh, shit, this is scary, to be like, what else can we do? And I think that is what, where the optimism piece comes in. It's like actually to allow our minds to go to those places of envisioning something better. And I think it's a better choice, isn't it? I mean, it's very hard. I, I think, you know, it's probably a bit flippant to say that we can just choose to be optimistic rather than, you know, yeah. if we're born pessimists. But um, I would like, you know, I would like personally to be able to make that choice. And to just kind of say, well, like I realized the other day, being a climate pessimist is not helping me and it's not helping yeah. anyone around me. So how about I change? Yeah, choose to be more optimistic about it. Yeah. And and can I actually add another crazy stat is that um, optimistic people are 40 percent more likely to get a work promotion within, within the next year than uh, pessimistic people. That was another study they showed. So you're 40 percent more oh, likely really? to succeed. And it also leads to healthier, better lives. People who are optimistic tend to live longer, get fewer health disease, um, heart diseases, and, and all these things. And it's because if you're optimistic, you look at life from a different lens. You take care of yourself, you eat the right foods, you, you believe that you're going to have a great future to look forward to, which you want to be around for that future. So it makes sense to take care of yourself. And so it's proven that to be optimistic actually benefits you in so many ways. Um, and, and, and just back to choosing optimism, because that's something else I like to talk about. Yes, you can choose to be optimistic, but choosing it would only take you so far. It gets to a point where like, because when you choose optimism, you're like, okay, I'm going to find reasons in my surrounding world to believe that this is possible. Like I'm going to look for that reason to be optimistic. And there is so much negative out there in the world too. So if that's the only source mm -hmm. of optimism that you have, it actually is going to fall flat pretty short, pretty fast. Um, instead, if you are becoming your own source of optimism, so you are creating optimism and that's back to the activism and the happiness hormones. You're becoming the change you want to see. You're not just hoping for things to work out. You're, you're making sure that they actually are. You're part of that journey. That is how you're fueling your own optimism. And it's so much easier to stay optimistic that way. How did you make that flip then from, you said you really sort of struggled with climate anxiety for quite a long time. What made you move away from that sort of crushing anxiety into where you are now of being optimistic? <laughs> Um, well, first of all, it was just recognizing that this is not taking me anywhere. I was what I called an angry activist. I tried to force people into doing the right thing, shaming people, you know, back and forth and, and didn't help anyone. I think it just lost some friends in the prog progress. And, and I just was like, always tired and, um, you know, didn't feel like there was any reason to keep going and had no hope for the future. And I told myself like, this is not going to work in the long run and you're in it for the long run. So how can you do things differently? 
Um, so that's how I started first to become a climate optimist. It's actually like a message that was delivered to me from some supernatural experience. But, um, mm, but then, it, it, then it took me a few more years to realize that, you know, choosing it is not enough. You have to actually create it. So I just, you know, I do what I can. And I understand that like my individual actions alone are not going to change the world. I'm completely aware of that. But I know that they're changing my world. You know, I feel better by doing what I can. And they're mm. ripple affecting, like I'm planting seeds. People see that and they get inspired. So I think taking you know, ownership of your own life and what you can do, you're actually adding that energy to the universal energy. First of all, you start to believe in the change and that means you can you know, do more and believe in more things. And you are impacting people around you. Every single day, every choice you're making, you have an impact on, on the world around you. And I think you know, taking it back from like, how can I change the world to how can I change my world? And knowing that if I do so, I will actually change the world at large as well. And that's really important, isn't it? When we think about how hopeless we feel, it's like, well, how can we enact change? Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned earlier about like these little micro actions and that every little thing that we do can have an effect. Um, and I, th I think there's something about when it doesn't feel like our governments are doing enough. You kind of think then, well, where's the harm? Um, if I buy mushrooms that are in a plastic packet or all these little mm. things that we do on a day to day. Yeah, it's realizing that all those little micro things that all of us are doing is having a massive contribution. And so, um, so yeah, re regardless of the fact that our gov governments aren't doing enough, we can still make those changes ourselves, can't we? Or it's still important that we do. And I think the governments are reading you know, reading the shift as well. I think a lot has happened mm -hmm. since Greta Thunberg came out and like people suddenly, kids were marching all over the world. That definitely had an impact on European politics at least. Um, and so the action was kind of spurred. And yes, I, I'm too like too frustrated with, with governments all over the place. And it feels like sometimes mm -hmm. you're going backwards, which it's actually not true. We are moving forward. But I think remembering that we want to sh change the system, but we are the system, you know, everything we do adds up to the system. And so if enough, enough of us start doing something differently, that's gonna impact politics around us, it's gonna impact you know, the consumer culture around us and everything. And mm -hmm. we need to not under underestimate the power we have in those small actions leading up to bigger actions. Um, and again, yes, I mean, call, call the elective officials in your community, you know, get involved with local politics because you have a lot of power right there. But you know, just gain or like agency over your own world and do whatever you can, because at least then you feel less anxious and you are becoming that ally that we need for this this movement forward. I guess there's big cultural shifts that we need to accept as well, aren't there? And we need to accept not having such a, and I'm going to do this in inverted commas, like an easy life in that we've, in the West, Western countries, we've got very used to getting our Amazon delivery the next day we've got used to buying 17 tops which will wear one and then we'll replace them in six months time and so it's, it's changing what we accept as what, what's the word I'm looking for I was gonna say a good way of living I don't mean that but convenient. accepting convenient yeah exactly mm. and so having to change that kind of cultural headspace I guess that takes a while yeah or does it I mean can it just happen overnight? I, I think that's where the slowing down piece comes in you know okay because you're so caught up in the hamster wheel that you're like, I need something by tomorrow and I have a party on Friday and I don't have nothing to wear. I'm sure I have something to wear, you know? And yeah, I think yeah, I got something. that's such an easy way to shift the culture is just keep repeating your outfits, wear the same dress. And when you get comments on it, be like, I love this dress and I don't want to contribute to fashion waste or, you know, mm -hmm. and whatever it is. And that's such an easy conversation starter and say it in a way that you don't shame people, but like, you know, be inspiring and, and um, share that with excitement. But I think it's like taking a step back and say, is this actually important? Do I really need this right now? Even for me, it's like when I'm out and I want a coffee to go, if I didn't bring my own coffee cup, which I try to carry with me, it's like, I can probably survive another hour without coffee. Like it's fine, you know, truly yeah, it's okay. Yeah. And I think when you take it back, you know, one step and just, just look at life from a different lens and say, how much are we just rushing around? And maybe I can actually gain more from doing less. And I think that's another way to shift the narrative on climate change. In every conversation, it's not just about how we talk about the problem, but how do we talk about the solutions? We say, we have to drive less, we have to eat less meat, we have to cut down on plastic, we have to stop consumption. And every single part of that is like negative terminology. It's cutting down, it's doing less, it's sacrificing, you know, and our brains are associating all these things with like a loss, like we don't want that. So back to how our brains are wired, we're not going to act on things that we think are a potential loss to ourselves. 
But if we just shift how we talk about it, it's like, instead of saying I need to eat less meat, say, I would love to try more plant-based options or, you know, maybe mm -hmm. vacationing close to home this year, we can have more time to just spend with each other and have more quality time. Um, maybe I can just keep wearing the things I love more. And so when you start think, talking about more and, and, you know, trying new things and having new opportunities, your brain is going to go, that sounds interesting. Let's try that. And I think once, once you start to like implementing, doing less technically, you're gaining more because you're more here for it. And that feeling of just being more present is, I think, what we're all looking for. Um, so yeah. I do, do think there's a shift that needs to happen. And there's a lot of culture shifts in that. Um, but it can be pretty fast. As, little, as soon as you just take a step back and ask yourself, what is actually important and what do I want? Um, I think we can get there pretty fast. As per usual, we invite our guests to give us a bit of a challenge so we can try and feel as good as they do. I would say when you wake up tomorrow, skip the whole responsibility part that's infused with shame and blame and, and all this doom and gloom. And instead tell yourself, I have the opportunity today to participate in the change. And ask yourself, if I have the opportunity to be the change I want to see, what can I do today? And you just do that every single day. And it's going to keep adding on. And I think as soon as you do that, you, you know, you start, you jump on that wheel of activism and your body will take care of the rest. It's going to feel so good that you're not going to stop. And I call it being an optimist in action. You know, it's not enough to just be an optimist, be an optimist in action. I think you should give this thing a try. Oh, yes, I do. I think you should give this thing a try. Thank you so much to Anne. We both really enjoyed talking to you. And if you want to find out more about The Climate Optimist, then head to www.theclimateoptimist.com, where Anne is launching a new masterclass dealing with awareness and climate anxiety, how to shift conversations about climate change and what we can do to be actively involved. And she also has a book called The Climate Optimist Handbook that's going to be coming out this autumn. So keep your eyes open for that. I really enjoyed that chat. I um, I really enjoyed it as well. Yeah, I think it's actually really timely, um, especially as we're currently stood in our um, sound booths in a heatwave. Sweating. <laughs> so hard. It's um, pretty hard to feel optimistic about the way the world's going with vis-a-vis -vis climate. So um, it is, yeah, I think it's just... For me, this has felt really, really good timing. But but also, like we were saying, it's not just about climate, is it? It's about no. anything that you are passionate about or potentially get enraged about. And, and yeah, trying to shift from feeling hopeless. I think that's the thing, that's isn't it. it? It's shifting from hopelessness to a bit more hopefulness. Yeah. That was exactly it for me. The main takeaway from that was, yeah, not, not burying your head in the sand or being naive about the realities of what is going mm. on. That's not what it's all about. It's just not being paralysed by fear. And that hope that you're talking about, that is sort of enables you to actually act and make changes and get involved in a way that can be quite hard when you're just feeling panicked and overwhelmed. Yeah. And like I think I was saying, you know, when you feel that hopelessness, you're a bit like, what's the point? What's the point in me doing yeah. anything? Yeah. And it can be very easy to get into that position like, oh, well, the, the changes that need to be made are not something I've got any control over. You know, stuff that needs to be done at a corporate level or stuff that needs to be done at an industrial level. Yeah. Like, how can I, how can I impact this? Yeah. But actually... That sort of reminder that those changes that we can make as individuals, they do have value and benefit. Yeah. And they are yeah. worth doing. And that all our little steps, totally. no matter how... And the, and the thing about... I was going to call it anarchy. It's not anarchy, is it? Let's bring it back a step. <laughs> activism. The thing about... <laughs> anarchy is stage two. <laughs> the thing about activism was also that it takes many different forms and many different guises. Yeah. Yeah. Some which will suit yeah. us. And some which won't. So it's about what's pick. What is about picking what suits you, and um, 
and bloody well running with it, isn't it? And and hopefully yeah. feeling good about it too. Completely, which is a big one. And so that leads me on wanting to ask you, what did you did you find a way of putting into action the task that Anne sent? Us? Yes. And if so. Well, yes. Okay, tell me. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just <laughs> jumping in there. How did it make you feel? <laughs> I remember that whole thing, like, only ask one question at a time. Don't ask someone, like, three questions and then set them rolling. One link, one link. Um, especially, or one link, one thing, especially when their brain is like mine. Um, so, <laughs> yes, well, I, I mean, like I said, I'm such a climate p- pessimist. And I did come away yeah. going, oh, this is going to be a big old train to sh- to turn around, you know, a big old yeah. ship to um, yeah to turn. Don't talk about yourself like that, Gwen. You're not a big old ship. <laughs> You're like a super svelte yacht. <laughs> I'm a cruise liner that takes ten hours to turn around, um, and many many miles. Um, so yeah, so. A- so my first step, I was like, right, OK, yeah, I'll write to my local MP and councillor and wrote to them. And to be mm. honest, I mean, there are better ways of doing it than I did. I just wrote to them going, I'm feeling hopeless. What are you doing about it? And, and I did sort of say, and is there anything I could do to help? <laughs> Question mark. Oh, well, yeah. you, you, know, you can only applaud that, yeah. right? <laughs> but I sent that off and I got one of those out of, you know, one of those automatic responses, automated yeah. things that like, we get a lot of... Well, a lot of stuff in our inbox. We won't necessarily reply to you. Yeah. So, and also... A work experience student will reply <laughs> yeah, to you in maybe. 20 days' yes. time. Yeah. So I kind of did that and just sort of thought, I don't yeah. feel much about that. Especially because I don't... Me and my me and my local MP, our... Um, I don't feel that our kind of... We don't vote in the same way. We, If I had... Yeah. Sure. If I had his right to vote, I wouldn't be re- voting in the same way as him on a few issues. Okay. Um, but anyway, then I... What I was I was like, right, what am I feeling angry about? One of them is the bees, um, that they've recently lifted a, a pesticide ban so the sugar beet farmers can get rid of aphids. So my dad's a beekeeper. I'm a bit like, Dad, Dad, what can right. I do? He's like, oh, it's... T- so, sorry, go on. I was going to say, just backtrack a bit. So the pesticides are damaging to the oh, bees. Oh, sorry, yes, that was an important fact. Yeah, <laughs> these, are, <laughs> these are pesticides that kill bees. And the right. so they're they're banned in the Scary. EU. So right, yes. so it's as a result of coming out yes. of the EU that they're now able to use them. This is my understanding. Oh. And um, yeah. anyway, and I was feeling a bit hopeless. My dad is feeling a bit hopeless. And but anyway, I thought nope, not going to give up. Went online. I found a petition by Greenpeace. I signed it, yeah. and then also, you know, when it's like share on your socials, and I'm always like, nah, skip that bit. This time I was like, no, I will. I shared it on Twitter. Okay. A couple of people liked and retweeted. I shared it on Facebook. I also donated, and I think this is something that we're a bit scared of, especially when times are tight, okay? Um, yeah. And But you can donate like as little as like a couple of quid. And I, I donated yeah. a fiver, and I thought, well, you know, it's a one-off payment. It's just something to... Sure. to put into the into the pot um so that made me feel good that made me feel like ha huh, i've done something okay. here okay so this is interesting so you did get a bit of a oh that feels nice to have yes. put my voice out there yes definitely Brilliant. And then I was buoyed by that. I thought, well, what else yeah. am I feeling desperately unhappy about? And it's it's a reversal of Roe versus Wade in the US and that basically women's reproductive rights have just taken a nosedive and gone back 50 years. And I've just been feeling so helpless about that in the UK. And I went on and I found this site and this article on, on um, a site called The Conversation called Five Ways You Can Get Involved in Fighting for Women's Reproductive Rights. And it's written by somebody in the UK. And anyway, well, I'll put the link in the bio because there was... Um, yes, do. I ended up adding my name to a petition by the British Pregnancy Advisory Service to Liz Truss. Um, okay. I ended up also donating five quid to the National Network of Abortion Funds in Oregon, which is fiercely devoted to supporting the 90 plus abortion funds in this international network. So again, mm. I, again, I shared Brilliant. them on my socials. And and it's yeah. it's... I think you can literally say, I'm feeling hopeless or how can I help? And and articles will come up. And articles yes. like that where they give you a whole range of things you can get involved in. 
I mean, from yeah. your sofa. That's well, that's the dream, isn't it? <laughs> to change the world without leaving your sofa. <laughs> and it's just, and then little things like retweeting extin- Extinction Rebellion's tweets about the heat wave, and it's stuff like that that actually I feel like I usually shy away from a little bit. I don't want to feel ranty yeah. on my socials, but um, I'm the same, actually. Yeah, but I actually think it is important, and we've got voices, we've got friends and followers and this is mm-hmm. that's what social media is for so yeah i mean if you are if you are following Excellent. me on my socials you'll think that i've become an activist overnight because i have <laughs> because you have and why not why does this have to be a slow a slow build i like the uh, zero to 100 miles an hour in five minutes approach yeah. definitely but i but that is really interesting and i can totally see how realizing that there are people out there who are fighting really hard and that you don't need to sort of start from a blank piece of paper and work out how you're going to change it all. You just need to find the people who are already yes. starting that work that needs to be done and join in. Yes. That feels a lot more approachable and a lot more doable and more achievable. Yeah. And inspiring. Yes. And loads of these charities, they have template letters to send to your local MP. So you don't have to yes. just whiffle waffle and go, what am I writing about? They, and and yeah. actually, my, my takeaway from it is, and from chatting to her, is that, yes, actually... It is important to sign those th- to, to sign those um, mm-hmm. petitions. It is important to share them. The numbers are important, and also, yeah, if you feel like your your letter is a drop in the ocean, you know your letter to the MP. If they're getting letters from everybody, it's got to make it's got to make a difference. Yeah. and that's what I felt. It's got to make um, yeah. it's got to have an impact. And there are going to be people listening to this probably who maybe already do that mm. and are thinking, come on, girl, I can't <laughs> this believe you've is not been you can do for the last <laughs> 20 years. But the fact that we haven't and that we felt like it was pointless yes. and that it was just going to disappear into a big black hole and have no impact, if we felt like that, I imagine a lot of other people have probably thought that as well. Exactly. So it, yeah, and it... it and I think just the point that it doesn't have to be a huge thing that you're doing. It's kind of little and often almost. Yeah. Like the sort of lifestyle changes that a lot of us want to try and make about, you know, something simple, which is so everyday now, like recycling, obviously. But it, little and often can be really just as impactful as a massive gesture as well. Yes. I think. Um, Erica, yeah. who does our artwork, she was saying that there's a book. Hi, Erica. There's a book called Craftism craftivism um which is about how gentle activism people making their like protests out of pieces of art and sending them off to their mps Uh, and so there's all different ways that you can that you can be an activist anyway how about you kate what have you been doing well this kind of rides off the back of what you were saying a bit about researching for example the the roe v wade and trying to find out who was what was happening against that and trying to find out how you could get involved Mm. i thought i wanted to go and research some good news stories as well and this kind of came off the back of my obviously us talking about this but also my my 10 year old daughter having real climate anxiety oh. and not been able to sleep at night because she was worried about the polar bears you know and mm. I just thought right okay there's got to be people out there who are doing stuff that we can feel positive about and that might get us into that headspace that Anne was talking about that headspace of being able to act and be involved as opposed to just freaking out and yeah. feeling like you were powerless yeah. And one of the stories I found, which I found really fascinating, was a news story in the BBC um, about Finnish Finnish researchers having installed the world's first fully working sand battery, which can store green power for months at a time and solve the problem of year-round supply, which is a major issue for green energy supply. And trying to find stories like that, which are really fascinating and inspiring to know that there are these big organisations out there who are really dedicating time and funds into finding a really sustainable way of being, of changing the infrastructure of our society so that we can, as a society, tackle these problems head on. And so I found that in the same way that you sort of writing these letters gave you that real boost. This made me feel really positive and like okay you know we can it's still worth fighting for yeah and what can I do to act and a big thing that I've been trying to do which is on a very personal level is to change the way that I buy my food 
Right. So to try and food shop in a way that doesn't involve places that use lots of packaging. Mm. So something simple as going to my local grocers, which I know sounds like such a simple fix, but actually these busy lives we yeah. lead. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard not to take the easy option of you just go to Morrison's and get everything in one place yeah, of and course. you're back home in an hour. So yeah, and that's made me feel really empowered and engaged and wanting to continue doing this you know yeah going ahead and was that reassuring for your daughter as well to know that there is that there is good news and that people are doing stuff yeah really reassuring Mm. one exactly as you said so not to repeat your words but yeah to know that don't worry it's not just we've not just all sort of hanging our heads and waiting for it to happen Mm. people are you know coming up with brilliant solutions and also and this reminds me of something that Caitlin Moran said in her latest book and she realized the pressure that she without even knowing she and her friends were doing it were putting on her daughter and her daughter's generation just little comments Mm. here and there like the world is fucked it's over to you kids we've messed it up it's your generation who's got to fix it yeah and she realized that actually god that was weighing heavily on her daughter's shoulders like it's up to them to fix it. Yeah. And likewise, I mean, I know my daughter's only 10, but likewise that, like, it's not, you know, we're not, it's not up to you personally to solve all of this. We're, we're all in it together. And look, there are people who are really putting heart and soul into it. Yeah. And you're going to be part of this, but it's not all on your shoulders. Yeah. As your, like her generation. Yeah. As opposed to her as yeah. an individual. And, and because that has been the attitude, isn't it? It's about future mm. generations or it's going to be fucked for our great children or grandchildren. And I think all of us have slightly been like, oh, well, they're going to have to deal with it. But it's it's mm. happening now. It's why I'm stood mm. in my underwear in my sound booth. It's it's yeah. happening everywhere. <laughs> So exactly. we've got to do- thank yourselves, listeners, that this is audio only. Actually, no, let me flip that around. Not thank yourself. Unlucky you that it's audio only. I'm so if you sorry for you. Um, but yes, I really what you were saying about good news stories, I think, is really important as well, because yeah. there is this term doom scrolling where we just get a little bit yes. addicted to the bad news. And I think we can, I think, to just pepper our feed or to just kind of tailor our feed to be a bit more positive it's going to make yeah like you said it's going to make you feel more positive it's going to make you feel more empowered and that the things that you are the small changes you can make in your own life are worth doing yeah optimism in action isn't that what yes. Anne called it yeah and I so it's not enough to be an optimist you've got to be an optimist who's acting yeah and I totally get that now and, and yeah I want to give a shout out to Joe Hook who is one of our pioneer patrons in the rump Hi, club Joe. Hi, Joe. and um she actually suggested this um episode yeah. we are very persuadable we are very, our inbox is always <laughs> open uh, right up my podcast at gmail.com so we're always open to your ideas and um she said i love activism it lifts your spirits and makes a difference if you get eco anxiety which i do then activism will help ease it and she's sent me this link to this um book which i'll put the um, we'll put the link in the bio for this it's called All We Can Save, Truth, Courage and Solutions for the Climate Crisis. She said it's a powerful read. Oh, no, she didn't say that. It's the New York Times says. <laughs> <laughs> She's very eloquent. Yeah. <laughs> She's quoted on the cover. Um, the New York Times says a powerful read that fills one with, dare I say, dot, 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 hope. And she sent it to me saying, you know, I've, I, I've got lots of hope for you, Gwen. And oh. I think that's what we've got to. That is what action brings us, isn't it? Exactly. Hope is definitely the key word here. Yeah. So, Kate, are you going to continue with this? Are you going to... Is this going to be part of your life now? Definitely. (laughs) It's got to be. Mm. It's got to be. And just this approach, almost a subtle twist on it, I think makes it more sustainable. And something that she suggested to us, actually, that didn't make it into the interview, but having a, a piece of paper that you pin on your fridge or somewhere visible that just almost acts as a visual prompt of, you can just have the words written on it, what am I going to do today to be part of this? What am I going to do today to make a change or to help? And just having that little regular, out the corner of your eye, seeing it to keep it front of mind, yeah. I think can be a great way of it just becoming part of your everyday. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. What about you, Gwen? Yeah, definitely. Because I was a little bit sceptical as to whether this would actually be possible, you know, to kind of 
to kind of have any optimism with regards to um, the climate. And yeah. I really do feel, um, well, just, you know, not only with regards to the climate, but with the range of issues that I've come away feeling empowered Good. and I've come away feeling, well, less hopeless, I think, is my main kind of win here. And um, yeah, and I think I'm going to keep being more active basically and because because yeah it makes me feel good and it's hopefully helping so yeah. more of that tick and tick, tick and tick yeah. and if we can feel anywhere near even half as optimistic as Anne feels <laughs> then surely we're gonna feel <laughs> so much be better a wonderful place yeah. yes <laughs> Thank you so much for listening and do get in touch with us. You can email us at writeonmypodcast at gmail.com or get us on our socials, Instagram and Twitter. We're at writeupmy. Follow us and get in touch with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, you can subscribe and follow most places where you listen to this. And if you're on Apple or fancy going over to Apple, we would absolutely love it if you could rate us and leave us a review, please. And if you think your friends would like it, please share this with them too. And head over to Patreon for more Right Up My Podcast. You can join the Rump Club where you will get extra wiffle waffle, extra content and just a little bit more interaction with Gwen and I. We look forward to seeing you down there. It's a growing family. Head to patreon.com slash writeupmypodcast. And thank you so much to our team for helping us with the episodes, as always. That is Andy G, who does all of our totally gorgeous music. And Erica Francis George, who does the gorgeous artwork. We will be back in a couple of weeks, which our next episode that I am so excited about, Mr. <laughs> Motivator. And those are words I never thought I'd say. <laughs> the man, the legend. And meanwhile, keep trying things to make you feel good. Bye-bye. Tell me, did you like the podcast, Brian? No! Oh. If unlike Brian you thought our podcast was really great, then don't hold back, like, subscribe and tell your mate. But if like Brian you thought our podcast wasn't fun, then just keep quiet, don't feel the need to tell anyone. Oh, we'd love to hear from you if you've got some thoughts to share. Such rich and lovely views that all should be aware of. But I hope you liked our podcast and you thought it was really great. And if you did, like, subscribe and tell your mate. Cause we don't need grumpy pants bringing everybody down No, we don't need negative Nellies making people frown No So I hope you liked our podcast and you thought it was really great And if you did, like, subscribe and tell your mate